Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers and especially to Roman for inviting me one more year to RootedCon. This is my third year here. My name is Jose Luis, known as Pepe Lux. I work as a Zoom Suite and I've been, I'm a regular speaker at conferences and I'm going to talk about voice over our IP. So I don't know whether you are aware of uh, what it is about. And even if you don't know it, I'm sure that you all use it because you all use WhatsApp, Skype for voice communications. And I'm sure that at home you also have uh, fiber. And even if your telephone is analog, it's no longer connected to the same plug that it used to before, but now because it's plugged into the router. So to have communication within a voice IP system, we need two phases. We need a signaling phase. With this, I mean a change of messages, uh, for instance, with the server, let's say, like, hang up, this or that. And to do that, there are very many protocols out there. I will focus on the SIP mm -hmm. uh, protocol, which is the most uh, standard one, and it goes through 5060 UDP and 5060 TCP. I did not mention that, but within the SIP protocol, we have the SDP protocol, which only shows or appears when there is a call. And it is how gives information about how that audio communication will take place. The second phase, we have the media se session, that is to say real-time transport protocol, that is to say a change of traffic between the different uh, parties. For an, in an a v voice IP ecosystem, we have different players. We may have uh, telephones connected to the internet or analog telephones. We can connect to the voice IP uh, switchboard such as Apex. If we have a switchboard, we will be able to communicate between ourselves, but we will also will have to communicate with the outside, taking calls and making calls. And here we have the voice IP provider using or offering usability or operation to the uh, parties. So when I talk about carriers, I'm referring to Telefonica, Vodafone carriers, that is to say companies interconnecting conventional networks and the internet. So therefore, if we make a call in our countries, the voice IP provider will give the call to the carrier, the carrier will deliver it to the destination. But if we make an international call, a voice IP provider does not can do, doesn't know all the carriers abroad. Therefore, a wholesale is used. So a wholesale moves the traffic between countries. If we analyze the SIP dialogue, let us say SIP call, it would look like this. So we have Alice calling Bob. Bob would have to have registered himself previously in this system to take the call, and Alice will send an invite message through her server, and then her server will send that to Bob's server, either direct or through intermediary. And Bob's telephone will answer with a temporary code starting off by one, saying that it is available, that the phone has been registered, and then Alice will hear the typical ring and the hold on music. Then uh, 200 DC code will be sent in, and then the second phase, the media session, will start. That is to say, communication between the users. Up until when one of the two will uh, finish the communication, we we'll send a byte uh, message. If we analyze the message inside, for instance, we see that the C protocol is very similar to the HTTP. It is based on a number of headers, but the first line is the most important one, where we define the type of message that we are sending, sending in this case an invite, a call. Then the ORI is the user we are calling, the telephone number, at sign, and the domain name. Then we, there are also other headers, such as to identifying the origin and destination, the call ID, identifying those in the dialogue, 
what is called ID, we identify uh, who is speaking. And then the message body is actually the SDP protocol. SDP only shows whenever there is a call, and SDP offers us information about the IP address, the port, and the codes that are supported. If we send an invite message through a server, well, the server would ask us to for authentication. The SIP protocol, passwords are not clear uh, in plain text. So therefore, the server will send us a number of values such as real nouns, and then the client will answer with another message, that is to say another invite. But using the values provided by the uh, server and the URI in the message, as well as using his password, the password is only known by the server and the client, then an MD5 hash would be generated, would go in, would be put into the response variable. If someone captures traffic and captures a packet such as this one, uh, all the elements show but the password. So for with brute force, uh, with uh, brute force, you could try out several passwords up until you get the right one. We mm, are aware of it, and actually there are diamond seek track very old tools to take that down. But it is very important to have encrypted communication, first at the level of signaling, so that to prevent the stealing of credentials, then so that there is no session hijacking, so that there is no tampering of the SDP and the audio is sent out somewhere else. And then at the level of the media session, it is important to encrypt our information so that no one can listen to them. And this also asks us who wants to or who needs to encrypt communications. If we ask uh, common or standard users, the usual answer would be, I just don't care if someone listens to my communications because I have nothing to hide. But we all know that there are many companies interested in our data. We are not talking about voice, but browsing, email, so that they can produce uh, uh, profilers, so that they just push in advertising to us or whatever. If we are an uh, important person, relevant people, so we should encrypt our communication so that we are not spied on. And then, of course, criminals very much interested in encrypting their communication. And this generates a double need. On the one hand, we are looking for a robust enough system so that we, our communications are not taken down by third parties. But at the same time, the there is a likeliness of intercepting calls uh, on the part of the provider, for instance, listening to criminals. So encryption is not trivial at all. It is not about pushing a button and having all our communications encrypted right away. There are very many different ways of doing so. So going back to the graph that I showed you before, where we have an open communication system where everyone communicates with each other, it is just impossible to have end-to-end -end encryption. Our switchboard may be highly secure, or we may also find a provider that allows us to encrypt both communications as well as media sessions. But by the time there will be a wholesale learn in place, it is just impossible to encrypt communications. If we take a look at the internet, seeing how the SIP uh, protocol communication is about, we will find this typical triangle, where it tells us that we need a signaling server for devices to be registered to exchange messages, and then there is direct communication between two phones. This would be ideal, but far away from reality. You may remember that I told you that when to specify how you will communicate in yourself, you have to use SDP. SDP is embedded in SIP. And who creates the SIP? The phone does that. So SIP, when produces the pack and says, I need to send the audio to an IP address, which is in a private network. 
So if we do that, each of the phones will try to communicate with an IP address that has no access to the phone, no audio. So the reality is different. So there is always a relay server for the medium session. That means that communication goes through a provider. A provider will have the chance to listen, to, or could listen to our communication. If we want to use a uh, encryption system for our communication, there are very many different options. So there are uh, apps on Google Store to do that or any other apps. But we need to ask ourselves a number of questions before we decide for one of those systems. First of all, we need to see whether there is an end-to-end -end encryption possible. Even if the provider is selling an encrypting, uh, encrypted uh, communication that is not possible. Also, we should ask ourselves, even if there is an end-to-end -end encryption, do we know whether that connection is secure? Is there anyone in the middle who is monitoring that? Uh, perhaps we, well, we need to find out whether there is someone in the middle. In terms of the encryption keys, who generates that? Do we generate them? Or are we the only ones who know them? Or the provider, if generates them, can have access to listening to our communication. And if the provider has the key, they could record or our communications and listen to them anytime. When we talk about robust encryption, uh, we need to use software. If the software is provided by the provider, well, it's very interesting to see whether that software is open source or not. Perhaps the encryption system is very strong, but when you we call the uh, call button, then the conversation is recorded. So the same goes with cryptographic design. So we should know the type of cryptography that the provider that we are using uh, uses. It is a robust protocol, is it a well-known protocol? And even if the system is ultra robust, we really need to see whether servers are secure. Perhaps they are using a strong cryptographic algorithm, but perhaps the security of the server is really bad and someone may just uh, get in and start monitoring all the traffic. And then usability. We are not talking about an encrypted system allowing us to speak to our friends, but a system that could be used by many people. Most likely, the user model that will use the system perhaps will have people on the phone for a long time. So therefore, encrypted calls should be as easy to make as non-encrypted calls because at the end of the day, uh, users will go for the easiest route. And then an encrypted system should offer the same features than a uh, non-encrypted one. If we can only talk end to end, perhaps we don't want that. We need a number of features such as forking. So that is to say, having the possibility to register several devices, making a call transfer or to deviate our call, all that whilst encryption is maintained. So protocol allows us to encrypt uh, signaling as well as media. For signaling, for encrypting signaling, we will use TLS, and for encrypting media session, we will use SRTP. And for SRTP, we need another protocol. There are four options here. SDES comes by default, in the SAP protocol, we have the MIK protocol, CRTP, and the TLS, SRTP. As I said, there are two phases in communication, signaling and media. And this allows us to have full possible combinations, a fully open system where only we encrypt the signaling, the media, or where everything is ciphered. In an open system that we subscribe with the voice IP provider, we will be on one of the two top options. Doesn't really make sense to encrypt the media. Well, it's either 
either everything is encrypted or nothing is encrypted. We cannot really encrypt our call if uh, the person we call does not encrypt his calls. If someone captures traffic in an open communication, obviously, will gain access to everything. This is traffic capturing. Nothing is encrypted by a shack. So we see the calls, signaling, full dialogue. And then we could listen out to the whole communication. So we have these two way communication. Second case where signaling is encrypted, but uh, media is not encrypted. We have this, we are in the same situation. Same thing, signaling cannot be seen because it is encrypted. At least someone who captures traffic will not try to break our password. And now in break streams, we can see the two channels of communication and we can also listen to the recorded conversation. It's a very simple thing to do. In the third case, this is quite atypical. Signaling is easy to encrypt. Nearly all the physical phones allows you to do that. Yet audio cannot be encrypted. If we find a traffic capture of this kind, we will see signaling and uh, all the audio will be distorted. I'm talking about the HC mechanism to exchange the SRTP. This comes by default and this is supported by phones that support audio encryption. The problem with ST is that the signals travel in plain text. If we look for SIP packets and analyze the message, we see the whole pack and within the SDP of the caller, we see the two possible keys that are used for that communication. If we scroll down, the server tells us the key that is being used. Using that protocol, if we monitor signaling, we'll also be able to extract the audio. Now, if we look for SRTP traffic, we see that everything is encrypted. We want to find out about the connection ports. We will be using an app to extract the audio. We see the communication port. And with this data and the key that I have on this file here, we can use SRTP decrypt, where we just enter the decrypt key, and then it will extract SRTP in clear text. And then we will send that out to another PK file, specifying the ports that we want to filter. That would generate another file that would open. We could see the whole RTP in clear text. What happens in the last case where both Signaling and media are encrypted. If someone captures traffic, we'll not be able to listen to anything because audio is encrypted, same as signaling, so we cannot really see the encryption keys. But we can do is a targeted attack and then do man in the middle on the communication. That is to say, attacking signaling, and then the caller goes through us instead of uh, registering direct with the server. So that we will be creating to encrypted channel. The client will connect with us and then we will connect with the server. The audio will continue to be encrypted, but if we capture traffic, we will have plain text uh, signaling and audio keys. And then we will have the encryption key and we will be able to extract audio as we've seen before. On the top window, 
we have sncrypt. This is for you to see that everything has been encrypted in the port 5161. And then in the below window, we have a tool, man in the middle relay. When we open a connection in this port, we use some certificates that we have previously created that we will be offering to our clients. And then we forward whole traffic to the address where the client uh, intended to connect uh, originally. So therefore, we will be having two encrypted channels. When the user will log in, everything will be encrypted. It will go through TLS, but Man in the Middle Relay shows everything in clear text. Registering message it comes in with authentication. We will try to obtain the user password after that. And by the time we will detect the call, we will be getting the call now. And the call will be made. We will see everything in clear text. And then within SDP, we will see the encryption key. If we are capturing traffic, as I say, we are in the previous scenario where we have the encryption key. And with SDP decrypt, we could listen out to whole communication. And these are the keys. Therefore, SDES is quite insecure. It is very easy to listen to communication. The keys travel in clear text within SDP. And it uh, generates different keys for each session, for each address. And this is not good for secure communication. As I said before, we have a stronger, more robust mechanisms, such as Mickey. This protocol uh, has three. Uh, mode, uh, shared key, uh, pre-shared key, public key, Diffie-Hellman. Then we also have Diffie-Hellman with DHH Mac, RSA uh, reverse, and then three more modes, Ticket, Ibake, and Sake. It is not that we have uh, these new modes because the previous ones are not working, but they are targeted at different profiles, uh, user profiles. Let us take a quick look at them and the advantages and disadvantages. The pre-shared key one is a good one. At the end of the day, there is a key exchange between the users. So therefore, the provider is not aware of the key. So higher security. But the disadvantages is that we need a secure channel to exchange the key with the user. And then it has scalability problem. This is not good for large group of users. And if someone steals the pre-shared key, all the communications contacted with that key could be decrypted. Then the RSA mode uses a PKI for authentication and exchange of keys. This is quite costly to keep, especially if we are talking about a voice system. Perhaps the system for web pages, we can afford ourselves for some gap, for some delay. But in a voice system, latency is essential because it takes up resources, therefore undesirable. And then when the keys are held by the provider, so therefore the provider have access to listen to our communication. Diffie Heldman mode has also two modes of use, might be used with PKIs or without it. If we use it with PKI, we have this uh, loading of resources, and then more resources are needed for the exchange of Diffie Heldman keys. So open or likely to receive denial of service, provider can listen to our conversation, and if we do not use PKI, we could also be subject to money in the middle. Now Diffie Hellman reduced using uh, HMAC instead of RSA, so we need a safe channel to share the key, problems of scalability. When in, in our system, the provider is not in between and uh, no chances to listen to our conversation. The problems or challenges are challenges of scalability. RSA reverse is a bit uh, 
dangerous because the receptor generates a secret using the key, uh, public key of the sender. If we replace the public key of the meter from by us, therefore the communications could be listened. Then that was followed by other modes. Contrary to the previous modes, this mode has been thought for large groups of users. This time we don't have the problem of PKI anymore. This time a key management service is used. In the first mode, a ticket one, distribution of keys is based on tickets and a high availability KMS is required. Messages go through KMS and that requires a high consumption of resources. And if each message has to go through KMS, a man in the middle attack could be implemented, therefore communications could be listened. Perhaps the strongest, the most robust protocol is this one here, always bearing in mind that providers could listen to our communication. Ibake. Keys are exchanged based on identity, where uh, there is a unique uh, value identifying us, such as our te telephone number, but it also uses a low availability KMS. KMS is accessed only once a month to upgrade keys. So therefore, an attack over this connection wouldn't really make sense because we don't know where it will be, well, we will log in. But again, the provider has our keys and could listen to our communication. Even if this is the most robust of all, it was followed by this other one. Key exchange is also based on identity, also low availability KMS, but the difference now is that there is a key repository. So that means that all the private keys of all the devices are generated by themselves by using a master key. Therefore, the not only the provider can tap in a line or listen to specific communication, but may record all the communication and uh, listen to them whenever they wish. And this is this has been promoted by UK government. I mean, he can be secure to prevent third parties from intercepted, but we are in the hands of the uh, provider. We also have the CRTP protocol has been created by Phil Zimmerman. It was first used with soft phone created by Zimmerman, known as C phone. And it has been uh, designed to have secure communication in a hostile environment. The first mode is Diffie Heldman, similar to that of McKay, but this time the mechanism used is the short authentication string. So therefore, when we exchange Diffie Heldman keys, a full character code is generated that each of the interlocutors will have on their phone and they will have to validate manually. They will have to read it, will have to exchange the code to the interlocutor. If the uh, code uh, matches, means that there is no one in the middle. The problem with the Diffie-Hellman mode is that it requires lots of resources and the denial of service attack can be implemented. So therefore, the server may run out of memory and therefore we're not taking any requests from legit users. And then we have another mode, which is that of shared key. Contrary to what happens to me, K, we don't need an initial secure uh, key to keep that uh, key because we take advantage of the first mode. So we make a first call. There is an exchange of difficult man keys. Then we validate it, we validate the channel, we take it as a key, and then we pre-share a secret so that in future communications we don't have to use SAS. Therefore, we will be sparing resources. So this system allows us to see whether there is someone in the middle or not, including the provider. And the attacks on this protocol are based on the weakest uh, link, which is human. So it's just about uh, doing a man in the middle. So both users, we have a different SAS, and uh, we'll put a candle and we'll pray for the users not to validate SAS, because 
if they do it, they would have caught us. So we do a man in the middle again, and when the users validate SAS, we should um, mimic the other user's voice so that it uh, matches. So another point would be if we have access to a voice recording of any of the uh, of the persons, we could generate all the possible communications and to keep them in uh, folders. So imagine a voice recognition app. When a user says what is his or her SAS, the system should launch and launch the uh, the voice with the same SAS to put the voice over. Uh, we have the direct relay uh, eluding SAS. It's the same but anticipating the user. Before he asks us for the SAS, we ask him for it and we say that it's correct. Everything uh, mimicking the other person's voice. This type of attacks, well, the, the difficult thing is uh, the SAS validation. Once we've done this, well, both uh, persons speak about themse among themselves and there wouldn't be any way of detecting it. It would be easier. But the repetition attack would be much more complex, and it needs the um, attacker to be able to talk to two people at the same time. We talk, and uh, this is a much more complex attack. And if the uh, uh, callers know, know their voices, it wouldn't be feasible. We can also use uh, shared secrets. I was saying before that at a, f at a first call, we use SAS, we authenticate, there is a pre-shared secret, and the next time that we talk to that user, maybe they not ask, they don't ask, it for, ask us for the SAS. If we are at a system where there are many users and we want to listen to uh, conversations between two people, we can try to establish a previous communication with both of them, either uh, pretending to be somebody or just having uh, communication and to make um, SAS communication and to create a pre-shared secret. If we have a pre-shared secret among two people and they're going to talk among themselves, if we put in the middle, we won't be asked for the SAS and we would be able to uh, perform an effective attack. And another type of attack would be, well, taking advantage of security bugs. Some years ago, there was a, f a fail in the library um, CVTP that let us put the SAS that we wanted. Of course, the attack was highly, uh, was much more easy. And this type of uh, encodings are not supported by a physical cell phone, and we use a software. Where do we have it installed? On a mobile device. It could be relatively easy that somebody installs some kind of bug that could activate the microphone and listen to us. And I'm not saying anything weird. It's not, well, it's absolutely feasible. There was another protocol that it is uh, DTLS. Do you know what URTC is? No? Yes, well, DTLS is just TLS over UDP. It's a way of communication between navigate between browsers. We don't need the use of a cell phone, a software cell phone or whatever. We just have our browser. I guess that you have all seen it. We have our keyboard and we can call another user. The difference between uh, difference with other type of protocols is that we are logging into a safe website for the signaling and the audio exchange that is uh, encoded to goes directly between both browsers. So we do not have to go through a server that does a media relay. So it can be safer. WRTC lets us set the communication with different types of protocols. For example, if we have a SIP service, as we've seen before, we can use sockets, uh, safe sockets, to get in touch with the signaling server, or we can use it at platforms that do don't that don't uh, use SIP. For example, Jingle, that is an extension of XMPP protocol, and the ones that use uh, apps like Gzmeet, that maybe you're familiar with it. The point is that all signaling, as I'm saying, is through safe sockets, and the media goes directly from a browser to another one using DTLS. This type of solutions will can be attacked too. This it's a little bit more complex than the previous thing, and in this case, 
what should we do? We should be in the middle, in the signaling, as uh, has happened before, creating two channels. But after that, we would have to cheat the STP and saying that instead of having entire communication between both browsers, it should do a relay between both. So we should have a server for the relay. I have a demo here of an attack uh, to a type of communication using SIP over WRCC over VSocket, sorry. Here you can see it. The demos are in video because otherwise I would need three hours. Well, in the middle you have a cell phone that is for free. And this website, you just uh, type in your details and we register our server, in this case a um, test server that I have. And on the other side, we have a cell phone that I have another machine where well, I log in the same server with a different account. So let's make a traffic snapshot to see, without any kind of attack, what could we come to see with a pickup. So we register the phone, we make a call, and we uh, can be chatting for some, some time. OK, so now we see the call. We have to enable the mic. And uh, if we open this snapshot, for example, with Wildshark, as has happened before, in this case, we won't see absolutely anything. The signaling can't be seen because everything is encoded. And we won't even see the SRTP, SRTP sorry, because it goes through uh, DTLS. So in front of um, traffic uh, snapshot, we don't see anything, either signaling or media. If we want to intercept a communication, uh, such as telecommunication, we need to know where the cell phone is l connecting at. Is it connecting to, uh, it is connecting to a safe uh, website, but uh, all the data are sent through a vSocket. So we need to know uh, where this vSocket is communicating. So I'm going to use Burke to see it. Well, I just put the traffic through it, and when, when when we register the device in the book on this tab, we can see the connection. We can't see anything because it's encoded, but at least we can figure out the port. In this case, it's 1081. Uh, so in order to make, to, in order to attack, I've used a Camellio server, and for the audio relay, I use RTP engine that is configured within the Camellio. Here you can see the IP address where it is executing the IP address to divert traffic and the sec secure port where the um, customer is going to connect with the man in the middle. The customer will send us his traffic instead of uh, sending it to the de to destination. As we're in the middle, we can see it everything clear. We're going to make a snapshot of the traffic to see what can we fish. And after that, well, I've opened the SN grep. It is a uh, similar tool to ngrep, but for SIP protocol, where we can see very clearly. Well, if it's not if it's not encoded, of course, we can see all the signaling. And when we register the uh, device, as it goes through us, we'll see communication very clearly. We have two uh, encoded channels, so the customer sends everything in code and we do the register with the server. Of course, we have many certificates, and the server will have its own uh, certificate, sorry. And uh, if we make a call, well, that's the Chameleon uh, lot where uh, well, we can see all the information that we fasted for. And if we make a call, exactly the same, we will get the signal. In this case, it will have SDP. So our function would be from Camellia when we get this package, uh, the SDP has to be altered. And we have to say that the IP address that we can see there won't be the one of, uh, from the other side, the other device, but it will be ours. We will send it. So we'll have an encoded channel towards us and, an, and another encoded channel towards the destination. And we'll, we've, made the, we've made the call. We stop the um, we stop the snapshot and we open it with Wildshark. In this case, is if we look for the uh, the upcoming outgoing calls, we can find it. And if we try to see the audio file, in this case, we have access to see it because, as I'm telling you, we are in the middle and we've created two encoded channels. So.
it's also possible to attack the WebRTC. The only problem that this has is that we need, obviously we need the user to accept a non-valid certificate. So in this case, it would be a connection with uh, the machine that we are using to attack and the port that we use for the US socket. Here, we would have everybody's engineer. I mean, the fact of um, making the user accept a non-valid certificate. If he accepts it, you can see that an attack can be done without any type of uh, problem. And I didn't want to leave without speaking about Signal. I guess that you all know Signal. Well, Signal is a protocol that was created by Moxie Marlin Spike. It's very well known by other apps, like, for example, SSL Strip, and so on and so forth. It's an open code uh, protocol considered as one of the safest protocols. And in fact, it is used by apps like WhatsApp, uh, Skype, Facebook, uh, Google, etc. But something that calls my attention are these pieces of news. For example, we see that Edward Snowden sponsored Signal. This is the only thing he trusts on. But on the other hand, we've seen pieces of news that said that WhatsApp is, is spying us. I'm sure that you didn't know this, right? So how is it possible to see this? So we need to make a difference between the Signal protocol uh, and the Signal app. It was also created by Moxie, and it was born um, through the merge of two um, apps, both Moxie apps, and it guarantees that it only has registry, registries of our phone number and the last connection. It doesn't store uh, connection registries uh, or calls. It doesn't record conversation, it's, and it's open source. But in front of, uh, before the same protocol, one listens and the other doesn't. So everything's focused on the trust that you have on your service provider. Signal uses its signal protocol, if, and uh, if it doesn't it doesn't listen to us because Moxie doesn't want to. If Moxie decides to push the red button to recall, record conversations, they can do it. And of course, well, if you use a very safe protocol, but we are behind a camera, we'll be able to be listened. And uh, as conclusions, we can see that uh, well, we have many protocols that are that are quite robust, but we always depend on the service provider. The service provider can always listen to our communications unless we use apps like uh, ZRTP, where we can verify whether there's somebody in the middle or not. In this case, the attacks are towards the weakest point. In Spain, our politicians use an app that is called Comsec from Indra, that it has a highly robust uh, encoding, it has an elliptic curves uh, encoding, and an attacker, a third party, won't be able to intercept communications. But we can see these pieces of news where they are putting a ComSec um, security at stake because some conversations have already been heard. So we need to trust our service provider, and they will always be able to listen to our conversations. And that was it. If you have any questions, thank you very much. Questions? There's one over there. There's somebody that wants to ask a question. Thank you very much, Pepelu. Thanks for the speech. I've seen that, well, there's a script that was an MTM proxy, and as you've said, when we have to compile Camellia to do something similar to what we've seen, I think that the word that comes to my mind is, I mean, balls pain, so to speak. Um, so we are looking for some proxies, and I've always looked for something that it was not a script in Python that is quite harmful to, because when you need to change the user agent and headers that your customer is using, you can spend seven days implementing that. Uh, the question is, is there really any proxy that can be uh, modulated that lets you do this in a very simple or efficient way? Well, the man in the middle relay is not mine, okay? It has been uh, programmed in Python, and I am from Perl. But this script is very good, not only for C, but for other things. And I've used it for uh, the simplest thing, just 
getting this intercepting the signal, you can have a certificate and you can record the rest of the traffic. Here, you don't only need a SIP proxy, but a proxy for the middle. So it is a little bit more complex. If it was that simple, there would be some tools to do it. But we need to analyze every single case. So first of all, we need to see where the USB socket is connecting, the type of communication that it doesn't have to be SIP. You can have a jingle. You can have a thousand stories. So these are focus attacks that you need to prepare. So we can't use a general tool for it. For, for all, I mean, sorry. More questions? Please move. There's one there and another one there. OK, sorry. Hello. Congratulations. And thanks for the speech. I'd like to ask you about the structure that you've put at the beginning, that, that triangle that you had to trust on the server. I guess it because of the private IPs, because they were uh, private IPs. Yes. Yeah, tell me, tell me. If there's IPv6, is it possible to uh, connect one phone with another one directly without needing to trust um, another server and everything would ch and uh, something would change, or do you still need to trust? Yeah, in the case of IPv6, you could connect them direct, connect them them directly. I still use IPv4, but yeah, when that you would remove that that problem, so you would solve it. Yeah, raise up your hand, please. Hello. Well, first of all, congratulations on your speech. I liked it a lot. This morning, at R and Victor's speech, we've seen that in mobile communications, well, they were going to go through HTTP two. Do you think that you, we would find this move in private uh, switchboards? I have no idea, to be honest. To make a change of something that is already has been standardized is highly complex. The RTC is a very good solution, but you need to drag everything that is behind, not only because you want to use SIP, but also because, for example, an operator that allows connections with, no, with normal cell phones, if you use SIP to use URTC together with the other things, you need some compatibility. Maybe a solution for some communications uh, could be used, but I couldn't tell you. OK, so we'll leave it for the next speech. Thank you. I have a question. Raul Silas did the analysis of the signal protocol with the, uh, the speech about uh, the ratchet. There are people that put everything at stake, and they assume that you put the word open on a product, and you release it so that people can have uh, open source, and that's really safe. So the fact of touching a bit uh, could change how robust things could be. What do you think about Signal? I haven't got, I haven't mm, digged a lot, but I think that we um, trust in Moxie. I think it's a good product. They, so until we find some type of scandal, I think that people tend to trust on them. I was talking about this uh, with uh, Luis Delgado. And the point is that well, when things start to, 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 to get to, to, to massify, so to speak, things start to, 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 to put pressure in it. I mean, last question, and we go to get some pies. OK, so please be here at sharp at 12.30 sharp, okay? Thank you.